Now let's take a look at uh, what we can do to restore applications into our private cloud. So what we're going to do is uh, look at the data, like recovering SQL Server's data, making that available through self-service. Also the same with virtual machines and uh, being able to get down into the item level recovery through uh, the use of virtual machines on Hyper-V. So when it comes to recovering the SQL Server data, you have some options as far as uh, where to do the recoveries to. And again, this should be a part of your plan. Whenever you're doing backups, it's usually because you have a plan for recovery, something of your business continuity plan or disaster recovery plan. So when you do the recovery, you can recover your data to the exact original location, which often is one of the main goals. But you can also recover it to the same location or original location, but by using a different name for the, uh, what you are going to refer to it as after the restore. You can recover data to a different SQL Server instance, and sometimes that's not even a part of a disaster recovery. That might just be wanting to create a test or a lab environment, a development environment, to uh, try out new changes to see how that would work in production. You could recover data to a network folder, recover it uh, to tape for a more permanent backup. You could recover the data and even apply additional log backups. Remember, again, I talked about those transaction logs, where uh, the things that were not written to uh, the actual storage are still there in a file that can be applied to uh, the backups that you have. Now as far as the self-service part of this for data recovery, well, pretty much all you have to do is start the uh, DPM self-service recovery tool. Now when you use that tool, it's going to ask you to connect to the DPM server. And what you'll do is to start off uh, by creating a new recovery job. Now from there, of course, you're going to have to choose what SQL server and database from the backups that you want to recover. Choose to what point you want to do the recovery. And then uh, you'll select to recover the SQL Server database, as I said, uh, to um, you know, that location or a network folder or any of the places we just talked about, uh, which is uh, the final part, which is the uh, recovery location. And then you're ready to start the recovery wizard. Now, as far as the virtual machine, again, you have to think about the fact that um, Hyper-V looks at the virtual machine as just a virtual hard drive. When you run the virtual machine and connect to it, it sees what's inside the virtual hard drive. For the virtual hard drive recovery, itself, you can recover it, obviously, to the same original location. You could recover the data to another virtual machine or to any other host, or you could just uh, copy it right off to a network folder for use in uh, whatever purposes you have. And that network folder could even be a share, uh, a library share, for the use of the virtual machine manager. As far as the item level recovery goes, as far as that process, when you start that recovery, you're going to basically, again, select the recovery point. You're going to select the virtual machine from which you want to restore the item. Make sure that you choose the VHD that contains the item that you want to recover, which would include selecting the files and folders that you are looking for within that virtual hard drive. You again, start the uh, recovery wizard, and of course, uh, select the network location and begin the recovery. Well, in getting ready to automate the private cloud, we're going to first start by trying to create a runbook server and uh, configure some integration packs. I'm on a server that we're calling our application server, and uh, what we're going to do is change some of the firewall rules to allow with some inbound communications. Now for a lab, I might normally just say, oh, let's just turn off the entire firewall, and that would be easy, but that's, you know, the sledgehammer approach when we should be using a scalpel when it comes to our security rules. Of course, I'm waiting just for the server manager to load up. I'll come up to the server manager itself, and um, I can go to the Windows firewall here. And uh, from you know, there's actually a lot of ways I can get to this firewall. I have the inbound rules listed here. I guess I could have also gone to Start and Administrative Tools and uh, Windows Firewall with Advanced Security, but it doesn't look all that much different because I still have inbound rules. So however way you like to do it, you can get there. Uh, from here anyway, what we're going to do is um, uh, with the new uh, inbound rule, I'll right-click it and say New Rule. And uh, this one's going to be a program uh, that we're allowing to communicate in, obviously, from Orchestrator. And uh, as far as the uh, path, well, we're going to use an environmental variable, which is what the uh, um, percent signs represent. So this is going to be the uh, system root, which would be, well, if I guess spell it right, though, otherwise it won't work at all. System root, which uh, environmentally usually means it's uh, the C drive or D drive, or wh wherever it is that you booted from. Uh, again, it could be, you know, different uh, just because of uh, the options we have. Anyway, we're going to use the uh, syswow64. Then I move, hit the uh, arrow to get to the end of that since I put it in there. 
slash orchestrator. And uh, it's actually the uh, orchestrator remoting service.exe. So, um, all right, so we've got that in there. It wasn't a folder path. That's obviously um, the actual uh, program itself. Then I'll click on Next. And uh, from there, we're going to uh, choose or leave it as Allow the Connection. And uh, we're going to uh, clear this off, both the uh, private and the uh, public uh, options here. And um, here it says applies when a computer is connected to a corporate domain. So if we're not on the domain, we're not going to allow this communication to come in. And uh, then we'll click on Next here. And the uh, name is going to be the Orchestrator Remoting Service. I mean, obviously the name doesn't matter as long as it's something that matches a naming convention and helps you later on. And then I'll click on Finish. So now we have a new inbound rule. All right, so let me close the uh, Windows firewall and back to our main screen. Now what we're going to do is deploy a runbook server on the uh, London uh, application uh, computer, which is uh, uh, this particular computer. But in order to do that, we're actually going to do it from the orchestrator server. So I'm going to switch over to that and then uh, come back and talk to you when I get to the orchestrator. All right, even though you might not be able to tell the difference just because of the background, we are on the orchestrator computer. And uh, what we're going to do here is um, locate uh, where we have the system center stuff stored under the uh, Start menu. There you can see orchestrator. And we're going to use the uh, deployment manager. Now here what we're going to do is uh, expand our runbook servers. And uh, this is our runbook server that we have over here. And in fact, uh, that's just the, the one that we have. I'm going to right-click this and choose to uh, deploy a new uh, runbook server. We get past that welcome page. And uh, over here, the computer that we're going to use is the London-AP1 computer. We're going to uh, log in with the uh, username of uh, the administrator for the domain, that is, not a local one. Put in our password so that we have uh, the credential set up. And uh, then we'll click on Next. Now here on the uh, integration pack and uh, or hot fixes, we're not going to choose any of these. We're just going to leave that as it is. Uh, here we have the uh, completing the runbooks uh, deployment wizard. I'm going to click on Finish. And then uh, we'll see if uh, we can successfully get that through the firewall settings onto the AP1. All right, looks like we were successful at that. The next thing for us to look at is registering System Center's uh, 2012 integration packs. So um, again, I'm going to expand this uh, orchestra. In fact, I'm going to make this full screen just so we have more room to read everything. And uh, we're going to right-click the uh, integration pack, since that's what I said we're going to work with. And uh, we want to register IP with the orchestrator management server. And uh, from here, of course, we get the welcome screen that we'll just click Next on. And uh, now we're on the hot fixes. We're going to click on the Add button here. And uh, what we're going to do here is uh, go to the uh, computer, to the uh, C drive. We have the Orchestrator 2012. Double-click the integration packs. And, uh, and then what we're going to do here is choose the uh, Service Center 2012 Data Protection Manager Integration Pack. Now, if, again, if you can't read all of these, just move them all the way across so you can see uh, what it's supposed to look like. So uh, again, Data Protection Manager Integration Pack is the one I'm going to choose. I'm going to click on Open, and then click on Next. In fact, actually, I might want some more. Let me just check to make sure I don't want any other ones. So I'm going to go back to the uh, Add button again. I also want the Operations Manager Integration Pack, I think, as well. So let me open that one uh, in here as well. And uh, while we're at it, let's also uh, add in the uh, Virtual Machine Manager Integration Pack. Now I've got three of them. Since I have all three of those components running, I thought I might as well put them all in here while I'm working with it. Now I'll click on Next and then Finish. And uh, with each of these, I'll accept the uh, license agreement as they uh, might pop open as we, uh, again, our goal was uh, to integrate these. All right, now what we're going to do is deploy the System Center 2012 integration packs to uh, the um, orchestrator and the AP1. There we go. Just had to finish uh, accepting those last ones. 
So what we're going to do here is, um, again, expand the uh, orchestration management server, go to the integration packs, and uh, now I'm going to right-click and deploy. So the last thing we did was register these. I'm going to deploy these, and again, we'll click on Next past the welcome screen. And uh, so uh, from here, again, we're going to choose the uh, Data Protection Manager as the system pack, uh, the System Center um, Virtual Machine Manager, and also the one for the Operations Manager. And then I'll, um, let's see, I think that should be sufficient, so I'll click Next. As far as the computer, like I said, we're going to deploy one of them on the one that we're on right now, which is the uh, OR1. We'll add that machine in here. And the next one was the AP1. So let's add that one in here as well. And uh, from there, we can hit Next. We're uh, going to uh, go ahead and uh, now here's to stop all the runbooks before uh, we, uh, we do this. Uh, we'll leave that just as it is uh, for the installation configuration. Uh, the uh, next part, we've got the uh, uh, finish point. So I'll click on Finish and see if we can deploy those out there as well. All right, so now let's uh, take a look at how we can uh, configure the System Center integration pack for our virtual machine manager, which we do have running. So um, let me uh, turn off here the uh, orchestrator uh, manager that we have. And uh, we're going to go back to the System Center options under orchestrator. And uh, we're going to choose the run book designer. All right, so uh, once this gets uh, running, let me uh, make that a full uh, uh, slide or full screen. I'm going to go to the options menu. And we're going to choose the uh, System Center 2012 Virtual Machine uh, Manager. Here we have the uh, prerequisite configuration. I'm going to go ahead and click Add. And uh, the name, of course, of that machine is the London VM1 that we're using. And uh, for the uh, type field, uh, let's click the little ellipsis here. And uh, for that, of course, we have the System Center Virtual Machine Manager. That works out perfectly for the type. Uh, I thought that would have at least filled it in for me. Oh, I get it. A little not responding, so I'm just being a little impatient while I wait for it to finish. So let me cancel that. Okay. Uh, so, all right, so we've got that one. I'll click OK. And uh, now what we're going to do is uh, we're going to try to add um, some more information as far as uh, what else we want to put in here. Uh, we've already got the item uh, that we've uh, set up as part of our prerequisite uh, configuration. And let me uh, see what else I have here with the uh, add. Oh, let me cancel that out. Let me go back to this one, and uh, let's click Edit. That's the one that we had in here. Yeah, I got a little carried away when it uh, died on me. Uh, all right, so the uh, console for the uh, VM, of course, is on the London-VM1. Uh, as far as the administrator console, the uh, server is also the London-VM1, not this local host. That's important. The user is the administrator. The domain is uh, Contoso. And my password. I'm not going to tell you guys my password. Okay, well, you probably already know it's the same as everyone else's. And we'll leave the uh, authentication type and port uh, information just as it is. And so now we've got the prerequisite information, of course, for uh, us as we're creating run runbooks to be able to work with the uh, virtual machine manager. And of course, we could do the same thing uh, repeated over and over again if I wanted to with uh, the uh, data protection manager or with the uh, operations manager or any of the other uh, parts that you wanted to integrate with.